Let's give the Lord a mighty praise today for the power of that name. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. We honor you. Can we tell one more time how much, I don't care how many times they come through here, I, I, I hope it's a lot, but we never take for granted the magnificent gift that God has given to the Katinas to inspire worship. We love you very, very much. And I hope you'll pick up every CD that they've got because they're, they're almost as good on CD as they are in person. Turn to two or three people and say, I hope a butterfly lands on your nose today. Some of you may not get that joke, but it is a possible occurrence. We released inside because weather didn't allow us to do it outside. We released 3,011 butterflies inside this room. And uh, some of them may be visiting you before the service is over. And that'll be all right. If you have your Bibles, you can open them with me to Psalms chapter 23 is where I want to start. While you're turning to Psalms chapter 23, it is going to be a magnificent week this week around here, particularly on Good Friday. Everything really kicks up, and, uh, and I'll be leading those services along with our team, Pastor Jonathan and all the worship team, and uh, 12 o'clock at noon from 12 to 1. It's one of the most beautiful experiences of our whole year, Good Friday. And because of demand, we're going to offer it again that night at 6 o'clock. And you can be a part of the same service if you can't make it at 12. Then all day Saturday, you know what's happening. And then Sunday, all the opportunities. You can go to Lake Lanier, and there will be a video message out there with a live band. Or you can show up right out here in the amphitheater at, at sunrise, and I'll be out there with our team. Or you can... Come to the 9 o'clock, you can come to the 11 o'clock and be in overflow if you want to, if you don't pick any of those others. So I encourage you to take advantage of all the opportunities. God, help us to exalt the Lamb like never before. I, I love Psalms 23, do you? Let's all read it together. We're going to take a moment and read. It's a very short chapter with six verses. I want us to read it out loud together at every campus. We're so glad all of you are there joining us at wherever you are at our campuses today. Let's go. Everybody out loud. Let's read the Lord's Prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to notice particularly, because that's what I'm preaching on this morning, verse 5. You prepare a table before me. That table that he prepares is the Lord's table, Holy Communion. And all that is in Holy Communion at the Lord's table under the new covenant that we're going to have together in just a moment is contained in the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is the same table as the Lord's table. And I want to share with you today the power of the Lord's table, the power of communion. When I come to the Lord's table I need to approach it with a fresh appreciation. It must never become common. This table that is before me today, the Lord's table, the fruit of the vine, the bread, the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples is so significant to our faith that I think if we're not careful, we will approach it in a common manner and it should not ever 
be approached without full revelation of what is involved in this meal. Now I want to show you the power of the Lord's meal today. Because this communion meal that we celebrate under the New Testament is the same in the Old Testament as the Passover meal. You remember the story when they were coming out of Egypt and God said, I want you to take a lamb and prepare a meal. And he told them what to do and he told them how to eat that. And he said that that would cause deliverance to come to your family. It would cause deliverance from bondage and deliverance from sickness and disease. Miracles happen at the Passover meal under the old covenant. And Jesus on the day of Passover in the New Testament entered into the communion meal and he instituted the Lord's Supper, which was the Old Testament Passover meal. And if the Old Testament had that kind of power in it when they ate the meal, how much more does the one that we have today? When I think about the fact that the 23rd Psalm is centered around a shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. And then, of course, in the 23rd Psalm, is implied sheep. If you have a shepherd and the sheep are going to lie down in green pastures, they are sheep. And when I think of the Lord's table, when he said, thou preparest a table before my enemies, there's a shepherd, the great shepherd Jesus, who is always attracted to this table. This table cannot be partaken of without the shepherd's appearance. As a matter of fact, when they took the Passover meal, your Bible said that God moved down from through the mountains to the camp of Israel. There is something about the Lord's table that requires a bringing of a close presence of God. That's why sometimes you feel something when you do communion, and it's not just an emotion. There is a guaranteed presence of God. I know God is everywhere, but he does not manifest his presence everywhere. But he said, anywhere this is entered into with full knowledge of what you're doing, my presence, the presence of the shepherd is there. The presence of the sheep are at the 23rd Psalm, and they're at this table because you and I are the sheep of his pasture. Notice that in the 23rd Psalm, thou anointest my head with oil, and that has a reference to healing. And there is an anointing at this table for healing. In the Passover meal, the Bible said after they ate the meal, there was not a sick or feeble one among them when they left Egyptian bondage. Something that they ate in the meal, it became the meal that heals. And when we enter into this meal, there is an abiding healing anointing on this meal. Not only that, but in Psalms 23, there is a cup, my cup runneth over, and we have the cup of the wine of the New Testament. And not only was there a cup, but there is restoration. He restores my soul in Psalms 23. And this is a meal where God says, I restore things. This is the meal of restoration. And then he said, goodness and mercy in Psalms 23 will follow me. And at this table is the goodness of and the mercy of God, and here's the point, when you partake of this meal with faith, it activates, that's a big word, it activates all of the promises of God. There were seven blessings that God told Israel he would put on them after they partook of the Passover meal. For example, he said things like, you'll have long life. He said, I'll send my angel before you. He said, I'll cause healing to come to you. He said, prosperity would come on you and you will become fruitful. He said, if the enemies come at you one way, they will flee another because seven ways because you will be under my protection. That was under the Passover meal. But Jesus, on the day of Passover, purposely, had the Last Supper with his disciples so he could institute this meal, the Lord's table, and all of those blessings are activated when we partake of this meal in faith. I want you to think about what I'm saying. The Passover meal came about, and you remember what God told them to do. He said, you are to slay a lamb for your house, and he said, you are to take the blood of the lamb and you are to place it 
on the side post of your door, paint it with blood on the side post of the door and over the top post of the door, you are to have blood. So you would be covered in the blood. You would be surrounded by the blood. But he did not say put blood on the threshold because the blood is never to be trampled. And here's the power of this. And God said, and when my angel, the death angel, it was not a demon, it was an angel. And the death angel, when he sees the blood on your doorpost, he, the death angel, will pass over your house. In other words, when you put this meal on you and in you, there is an application of the blood. The most powerful avenue of prayer, listen carefully, the most powerful avenue of prayer that you can ever learn to pray is when you approach heaven this way. Father, I come in the name of Jesus and I plead the blood of the Lamb. There's something about pleading the blood of the Lamb. And listen, if a death angel could not cross the bloodline, then I know one thing for sure. If an angel couldn't cross the bloodline, the devil cannot cross the bloodline. And there's power. There's supernatural power at the Lord's table. I plead the blood. He commanded them. He said, I want you to eat the lamb at Passover. And he said, eat all the lamb in Exodus chapter 12. Don't hoard it. Don't store it up. If you can't eat all of it, then he even instructed them, go to your neighbor's house and give your neighbor some. He said, if you don't, he gave the reason, it will begin to stink the next morning. They didn't have refrigeration. And he said, I want you to eat all the lamb, not a little bit of it. And I, want you, I don't want you to hoard the lamb. He said, you cannot hoard the lamb. After you eat it, you're supposed to share it with others. The lamb has got to be distributed to keep life in the camp. You want to know why so many churches stink? They stink of musky religion. Is they're not distributing the lamb. They're hoarding the lamb. It's all about me and there's nothing that's reaching out with the gospel. And the gospel is not just to be fed the lamb. But he said after you eat it and after you're full of the lamb, you are supposed to share the lamb. Distribute the lamb with somebody else. And then he says, eat all of it. Notice that in Exodus 12. He said, eat all of it, not bits and pieces. Some acknowledge Jesus as Savior, but they have not made him Lord. Savior's only found 33 times in the Bible, but Lord is found 400 times. And there's a difference between Savior and Lord. Savior means I've got fire insurance. I know I'm not going to hell, but he's not Lord of anything in my life. I do whatever I want to do, and I still have him as my insurance blanket or my insurance clause. But listen to me. If you want joy, he said, eat all of it. I don't just want him as Savior. I want him Lord of my life. I want the open doors and I want the closed doors. I want the yeses and I want the noes. I want the people he brings and I want the people he says are not good for me. And when you say, Jesus, this is not the Savior's table. It's called the Lord's table. And it's because he must be Lord. Eat it all. I don't just want salvation. I see baptism in the Holy Ghost on that table. I see deliverance from every addiction on that table. I see purity and integrity on that table. I see prosperity on that table. I see freedom on that table. And don't take bits and pieces of it. Eat it all. Eat it all. Think about this. The Lord's table, the communion meal, is the only thing of faith that we physically touch that we're told to physically touch. Every other thing in that Bible, he says you walk by faith, not by what you can see and touch. But when it comes to this table, God says there's something different about this table. It's the only place he makes active faith visible. I want you to come and I want you to hold the bread and touch the bread and it is a physical thing that you are touching 
that will activate these blessings when you partake of it. I want you to hold the cup. I want you to drink the fruit of the vine. And when you drink it, I want you to understand what you are touching and what you are seeing. Every other thing, you walk by faith. But this is a moment when your faith actually is to be connected to physical things that you can see that represent his blood and his body. And really what he's saying is, just as the, I was the word in the beginning, and the word became flesh, blood and flesh, and dwelled among us. When you take this meal, you are re, you're, he is being reincarnated in you through the blood, through the body. And the only Jesus that people see is the one who comes through you. And you are to expect when you eat this bread, which is my body, and you drink this wine, which represents my blood, then you are Christ is being reborn, re, reincarnated. I'm not afraid of that word because that's really what he wants. The Bible said your epistles read of all men. Your friends will never read this book, but they're reading you. And you're supposed to be projecting Jesus. And he said, I want you to physically take me in so that I will project out of you wherever you go. Say amen, somebody. I want you to think about this. It was a joy, joyous celebration, very joyful celebration. It was so joyful that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul had to tell them to tone it down. They were getting so excited about communion. We act like it's just a ritual. We act like as though it's just something common. But when they heard they were having the communion meal in the New Testament church, they went berserk and some of them went to the extreme and they were having so much fun at the Lord's Supper that Paul had to go. 1 Corinthians 11 is nothing but, but Paul correcting the extremities of the church. He said, you're speaking in tongues and that's great and that's a gift from God, but now you're starting to get up in church and confuse people with it by preaching in tongues and all of this. And he had to set it in order because they had gone to the extreme. And then he turns from that to the communion table. He said, by the way, I wanted you when I taught you, it was supposed to be, a, when they heard it was communion, oh, it was fun, it was uplifting, it was joyful. But then they went to the extreme. Some of them started getting drunk and really getting wild. That's in your Bible. But the, don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is a joyful meal. This is where when we come to the Lord's table, he says, I'm about to activate goodness and mercy to follow you. I'm about to cause your cup to run over. I'm about to pronounce blessings over you that will cause you to walk in my favor and my covenant and my victory like you've never done before. And so I want you to get up about it. I want you to get excited about it. I want you to get joyful about it because anything can happen at the Lord's table. He said, this do, told his disciples, this do in remembrance of me. So it's supposed to invoke memories that when I enter into this meal, I remember how lost I was. I remember how low I was. I remember how messed up I was without Jesus, how blind I was, how conceited and arrogant. But at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my soul, and you don't understand that line if you've never felt the burdens of your soul. You couldn't get out of the pit. You couldn't get out of the darkness. You couldn't get out of the night of your soul. But suddenly at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my soul, the addictions, the bondage, the shame, the guilt, listen to the words, were rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy. And now I'm happy all the day. Is anybody still happy about Jesus? This is a joyful meal. 
It'll give joy to you if you'll let it. Be not sorrowful. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you're running out of joy, you're running out of strength. Come to this table. It's a joyful celebration. Hallelujah. I know I need to calm down. I know I need to, but I just feel like shouting. I still am thankful that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Woo. When Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 26, he said, I want you to on, it says these words, just to point it out again, he said on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover, the disciples came to Jesus and said, where do you want us to have Passover? And he said, you're to go to a certain city and you'll see a certain, you're to go to Jerusalem, you'll see a certain man on the street, he'll be carrying a pitcher of water on his head. And isn't that amazing? He said, you tell him I need his house. He's got an upper room. He's going to give me that house, and we're going to have communion up there. Before he didn't, They didn't know it, but he was thinking before I go to the cross and die. Sure enough, they found this guy. Notice that he said, this communion meal that I'm about to, to cut with you is going to happen in a house. Jesus made communion a your house experience, not just a church house experience. That whatever we do in the church house, he said, it is not over here, but you're carrying it back to your house. The victory, the joy, the peace, the goodness and mercy and all the anointing and the cup that's running over and the blessings of this meal that are activated. It's not just in this house, but it's coming to your house. This is a your house blessing. It says in Exodus 12 that this is the beginning of the years. When they, when they started and had the Passover meal, it began, it began a new year. This is the beginning of the year. This is the first month. In other words, when we enter into communion in God, on God's calendar, he wipes everything out and he says, this is a brand new day. This is a brand new beginning. You cannot partake of this. And it just simply means that after you've had this meal, today is the first day of the rest of your life. The other stuff is over and you can have whatever I told you you can have. And it starts here and now. The past does not control you. The ghost of guilt cannot haunt you anymore. This is a brand new beginning. Clap your hands and praise God if you believe in the power of the Lord's table. Mm. He said, get full of the lamb. This is interesting. And when they served them in Exodus 12, the Passover meal, I should have put one out here. They had a side dish. The Bible said it, the lamb is to be served under the old covenant with bitter herbs. Bitter herbs. It was a side dish of bitter herbs. And that represents the bitter things of life. That whatever life sends you that could stain you and leave you bitter the rest of your life the sweetness of the lamb is supposed to even out the bitterness of life. And notice the bitterness is a side dish. It was put in a little side dish and they would put salt water and certain herbs that they would put in there and they would put it in salt water representing the tears that they, that they cried in Egyptian bondage. And the point is this. The bitternesses of life are real and they come to all of us. The bitter things that happen that, that, that change everything in your life. But they're just a side dish. 
And the key to overcoming the side dish is to eat the main meal, which is the lamb. And the sweetness of the lamb will even out the, the side dish of bitterness that life serves you. That whatever bitter thing that could turn you mean and ugly or just hard and cold, instead you keep eating all of the lamb. You get full of the lamb and the bitter things get evened out with the sweetness of the Lamb. That's the power of the Lord's table. He said, you are to take bread with you. They couldn't take lamb, but under the Passover meal in Exodus 12, it said you can take you some traveling bread. You're not supposed to come in here and just hear a sermon. You're supposed to leave here with some traveling bread. And if the devil comes knocking this week, you open the door and you got one of these ready and say, it is written, bam, traveling bread. I'm so glad I got traveling bread. Wherever I go, I'm never alone. Whatever I face, I'm never at, 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 a, at a point of exhaustion and being overcome. I got too much bread with me. I picked up a word from the Lord. And like Gideon's little, you know, Gideon in the, the dream that the man had in the Midianite camp that Gideon overheard. He said, I had a nightmare. And the guy said, what did you hear? And Gideon was listening in. He said, I saw a piece of bread rolling down the hill. It's called Wonder Bread. And it was, it was rolling down the hill. And it hit our camp and it wiped us out. And the guy said, that's the sword of Gideon. But I can't help but think that if we have the bread, just a crumb got one woman's healed, one woman's child healed from demons, but we've got the whole loaf in Jesus. And he says, don't just get a blessing on Sunday, but take some traveling bread with you. Somebody take a praise break and I'll keep preaching. There's nothing you're going to face that the word of God in you will not make you an overcomer of. Hallelujah. I like what he said too in Exodus. Can I preach a minute? He said in Exodus uh, 12, he said, now cook, here's the recipe for the lamb. You're not to put it in a pot and sodden it with water. I want the lamb on an open fire and I want it roasting. And don't put it in a pot, don't put it in a pan and do not sod it with water. Don't water down the lamb. We got too many preachers watering down the lamb. We got too many people who don't ever sing a blood song anymore because it's a little bit controversial now in the little nicey, nicey, little, little yuppie church. We don't like to talk about the power of the Holy Ghost, but you can't get the lamb without the Holy Ghost. You can't get the lamb without the power. You can't get the lamb without the blood. You can't get the... You can't get the lamb without sanctification. You can't get the lamb without a transformation. You can't get the lamb without throwing your drugs down and your alcohol problem down and your immorality away and saying, in the name of Jesus, I'm a new creation. And I like the fact that the lamb had to be served piping hot. Nothing between the lamb and the fire. I don't even want it in a pot, and I don't want it medium rare. I want the lamb on fire when it is, when it is presented. And we need to get some passion in our hearts, and we need to preach the lamb and serve the lamb with fire. I want to preach so good like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, that after he finished talking to the disciples, the disciples said, ooh, did not our hearts burn within us? You know what he did? He gave them holy heartburn. What he served was so on fire, he gave them holy heartburn. I don't want you to go home and take a nap. I want you to go home and say, my God, I've been living beneath my covenant. I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be worried. I don't need to be wondering if God's got a plan and a path to success and wholeness for my life. He does. It's at the Lord's table. Sit down. Sit down. Now, I have trained all of our musicians that at 30 minutes after I preach to come out and play keyboards. They know to do that no matter how good I'm preaching. They come out and it's, and it's false hope for you. Just telling you straight up. Psychological manipulation. 
to think that you're almost going to get to the parking lot and smoke a cigarette sooner than you thought. I'm almost done. Anybody not yet offended, raise your hand. I'm enjoying preaching on Jesus this morning. Now listen to this. He said in Exodus chapter 12, <laughs> he, said, he said, now there's going to come generations on down the road who weren't there at the Passover when you came out of Egypt. And the children are going to ask, what does this meal mean? And he said, you are, to, you are to take them back and teach them how you were brought out at this meal. This is a generational meal. I want families to have this meal together. Listen to this. And Jesus said the powerful thing right here. As often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Now watch this. The opposite of the word remember is dismember. Dismember means to be pulled apart. So if there are is anything that has happened in a family that was united and one, one together and maybe a disagreement happened and there is a dismembering. When you come to this table, there is a supernatural power to remember what has been dismembered. Whatever disagreements, whatever Things that have hit your family, that are tearing your marriage apart, tearing your family apart, tearing your relationships that you care so much apart. He says, when you come to my table, there is a mysterious power on this meal that it can take things that are dismembered and it can remember them. I'm talking to backsliders watching me by television and all over this room and at every campus who have been dismembered. You, you've, you've fallen so far away. But if you will, in humility, approach this table today, God says, I will remember those who have been dismembered by shame and guilt and sin. He said, you are to take this cup and it, it's the wine represents, the fruit of the vine represents my blood. Can I preach just a minute? The world drinks to forget. Oh, Willie Nelson. Whiskey River, take my mind. He's trying to forget something. I don't blame them. If I was in the world, I'd be at the bar getting drunk because I'd be trying to forget a lot of stuff because I know my marriage would be busted up. I know my kids wouldn't be talking to me. I get it. I'd, I'd be so sorrowful and it's sad. But the world drinks to forget. But Jesus said, what I'm serving you, you drink to remember. You remember that what I've done for you is greater than what you've done to you. And you remember the blood and you remember the cross and you say, I'll drink to that in remembrance of what Christ did. And when you do, it remembers things that have been dismembered. One last strange thing about this meal. And I'll close. But every count of the four gospels says that all that they had in that upper room with the disciples when Jesus had the Last Supper, all that we're told is bread and wine, the fruit of the vine. That's it. No lamb. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, no lamb is mentioned. There was no lamb in the meal. But the Passover had lamb. Why? Why? Where was the lamb? The lamb was not on the table. The lamb was sitting at the table. But 24 hours from that moment, they would drag him out 
and hang him on a cross. And the lamb would be crucified. And any time, let me tell you the mystery of this meal. Any time you come to this table, you cannot approach it without the lamb being on the table and at the table. He is here. I know he's everywhere, but he doesn't manifest everywhere. But wherever you approach it with revelation of what I'm sharing with you, he is here. Not only that, there's a mysterious recipe in the, in the wine. <laughs> because if you've ever busted your nose and had it drip on a white shirt, there's a crazy verse in John that says if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse you of all your sins. The precious blood of Jesus will cleanse you of all your unrighteousness and take your stain of sin away. If you know anything about blood, if it drips on a white shirt, that doesn't cleanse that shirt. It stains. it. Blood stains. It doesn't cleanse. But the blood of Jesus is different. Because it said in the book of Revelation, when everything's over, we'll be wearing white robes. And he said, these are they whose garments are white, washed in the blood of the Lamb. How do you wash something in blood and it becomes white and the stains are removed? There's a mysterious ingredient in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it removes the stains of sin. And this is the power of the Lord's table. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and take that little communion cup at every campus. And I want you to take it and I want you to open it up. I want you to take the piece of bread out of the top and then tear the, the little part that has the juice in it. Tear it back and get ready to have this communion, but not in a common way. Not in a common way. And if you need a communion this morning, you didn't get one at the door, raise your hand at all of our campuses and someone will find you right where you are. But on this Palm Sunday, as Jesus entered into Jerusalem, we're going to remember him. And I want you to know that this is the Lord's table. Look at that bread for a moment. It's just flat bread. It's just, it has no yeast in it. That's because he doesn't want you puffed up with pride when you come to this table. Puffed up with yourself. Humble yourself. As a matter of fact, I want to, I want to read this. I love the old blood songs. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Listen to these words. Look up here at me a moment. For my pardon, for my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So him says, nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I love the repetitiveness. For my cleansing, this my plea. Maybe I can offer this. No, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll overcome. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now by this I'll reach my home. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Glory, glory, this I sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All my praise for this I bring. Nothing. Isn't that some theology right there? Nothing. Come on, say it with me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take the bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, this do in remembrance of me and receive all the promises of God activated. 
goodness and mercy will follow you home in your house this week. Take it and receive it in Jesus' name. Then he said, I had communion in the first service and I don't want to do it commonly. But I'm going to take a big gulp of this. He said, this is my blood which is shed for you the remission of sin. Take, drink. He did say drink all of it, but I'm not going to do that. But he said drink this do in remembrance of me. Put the blood on the doorpost. It's a generational blessing. Would you take a moment now and just bow your head right where you're standing. You say, Pastor Franklin, I... I really couldn't partake of that meal because I knew in my heart I wasn't right with God. And I want to I wanna know that I'm right with God before I leave here today. Pray for me. Normally we call people down. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to pray for you right where you're standing. And a miracle is going to happen in your life today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, everybody still and quiet for a moment now. This is the most important part of this service. You'd say, Pastor, I need a change in my life. What I'm trying to preach to you today is you have a seat at the table. It's got your name on it. All you got to do is by faith come sit in it. Pastor, you're talking to me. If that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed, Pastor, pray for me. If that's you, boldly raise your hand right where you're standing. I want to see it. Beautiful. Wow. Amazing. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just keep your hand raised. Everybody look around you, and if you see someone with their hand raised, gently place your hand on their shoulder as an act of support. If you see people around you, they're all over this room. It's beautiful. Everybody now, together, pray this prayer out loud. Lord Jesus, today I receive the full benefits of the Lord's table. Your body was broken. Your blood was shed. Your life was given up so that I could be forgiven and cleansed. Every stain removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I am forgiven. I receive a new life. This is the beginning of a brand new life for me, a new beginning. And I receive it in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said... Amen and amen. Are you ready for the blessing? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and heal your body. By his stripes be healed and blessed in Jesus' name. Do you receive this word today into your spirit? You know you can have communion in your home all you want to. You are blessed today. Go in the name of Jesus. We'll see you Friday, Good Friday. Wednesday night we'll be having church. It's going to be a powerful, powerful weekend. Bring everybody you can to our Easter services. We're going to see God do great and mighty things. Go by the Katina's table and pick up their music and be blessed of the Lord. Have a great week, everybody.